Hi, I'm Zora. I'm an illustrator, artist, and comic artist. When it comes to comics, I'm something of a late bloomer. My background, as you heard, is in illustration. I've done a lot of educational and editorial illustration. However, I wanted to change the focus of my work at some point, and I wanted to create my own stories. So in 2009, in my late 30s, I started making comics. And the thing I love about comics is their ability to tell complex stories. How at the intersection of word and image, they capture the liminal to evoke empathetic, multi-layered narratives. I've got to press a bit harder. There we go. In my own practice, I use comics to question established ideas, to play with language, and to explore things lost in plain sight. Comics would prove the perfect medium when I wanted to understand and communicate an experience that reshaped my reality. In 2013, I lost my leg and right glute muscle to a deadly bacterial infection, necrotizing myositis, commonly known as a flesh-eating bug. What started as a sore throat soon spiraled out of control. The pain in my neck traveled and pulled in my thigh. I was in agonizing pain beyond anything on the scale of one to 10. The strongest painkillers were ineffective and I was dying, only I didn't know it. Soon after arriving at hospital, I drifted into delirium, a parallel shadow reality. A day later, I was ventilated and placed into a medically induced coma, within which I experienced vast, all-encompassing hallucinations. Unable to comprehend what was happening or why, fear shaped my reality. I was the main character a disorientated victim, trapped in a nightmare I couldn't wake up from. <laughs> there we go. I believed I'd been accused of multiple murders, and my accusers were my caregivers, and that I would suffer under their care. I knew I was in hospital, I just didn't know where. My local location and perception were confused. One minute I was seeing half skull faces at the end of my bed. The next I'm wading through a swimming pool searching for my children, or acrobatic circus ninjas were tumbling at the end of my bed. Relief would come momentarily, however, overwhelmed within this twilight reality, haunted by an unreal accusation I couldn't comprehend, I was riddled with a very real sense of guilt and shame. After 15 days in the coma, uh, coma, sorry, I was woken up. I was alert and immediately in the room. In contrast to what I experienced, everywhere was light and bright. I was ecstatic, free to be, free of a world of fear and mistrust. I had a strong sense of self and an awareness that I just endured, a purgatorial experience in an allegorical sense. And I was aware that nothing in my life had prepared me for what I'd just experienced. There was no blueprint. In time, with the support of loved ones, my body slowly healed and grew stronger. And as I adapted to life as an amputee, emotionally I grew stronger too. However, I just endured something that was incredibly real. It was a lived experience. If not in the real world, it wasn't of the dream world either. I was fascinated by it and haunted by it in equal measure. And I knew that if I was to heal fully, and I had to understand it, and I had to lay it to rest. So in 2016, I started to creatively explore it. However, I soon realized I'd been too ambitious. I was emotionally still very vulnerable. So I set it aside, and over the next 18 months, I started tinkering around the edges, making sketches, formulating a plan, and slowly I began to draw a long-form comic, otherwise known as a graphic novel. My objective in creating this graphic novel was not only to answer questions I had, but to shine a light on this inner world. The challenge was how do I visu visually communicate the intangible? 
Well, I started with what I knew, the places I believed I'd been to and the things I believed I'd seen and the emotions I felt when I was there. The places I'd been to related to my history and were triggered by phrases and voices I heard. And also I would later discover that they related to underworld myths. To depict emo um, emotion, bodily sensation, and abstract concepts like infection, I created a lexicon of characters to symbolize these aspects throughout my novel. Memory played a big part, memory and time, and in my hallucinations, they came from three different phases of my life. The first being an essence of childhood, flashbacks to scenes I'd witnessed, echoes in time. The second was the previous three months, including visits to Liverpool's Chinatown and my parents. My mother had died five weeks prior to my getting ill. And the present, things happening around my bedside, my awareness of them and how they changed my state of mind, like the time my children came in to see me at a critical point in my illness. Having written evidence of the present was vital to my plotting. My husband, Dan, kept a diary. It sort of bore witness to the times that veil between our realities was at its thinnest. Visually, the medieval was my route into drawing. My first hallucination had been a medieval skeleton spiraling across my line of sight. I also drew a map because I think maps are wonderful and every book needs a map. So my, my map is, provides a narrative for both myself and for future readers. The tears reference Dante's map of purgatory, but this solely refers to my journey. This is a, helpful for readers to follow my journey from the, from the base, spiraling from thoughts of accusation and fear through to the pin spinning sensation of wakefulness. There were things I discovered from my delirium when I was actually drawing. The acrobatic circus ninjas actually turned out to be surgeons, obvious when I'd drawn them on the page and compare compared them with Dan's account. The elements I discovered along the way were my hallucinations that related to language and myth. And many of them related to everyday language and common terms. So I'd seen a half, a face that was half skull and half real. So my body knew it was in peril, even if I didn't. It knew I was half dead. Another occasion, I'd been balancing on an edge of a feather over a body of water and there was a gentle breeze blowing around my body. And on this breeze were whispers, and they were whispering that I'd live, and I had no idea that I was going to die. So here I had a connection with underworld myth. So we had Norse myth, the goddess Hel, who greets the aged and the infirm as they enter the underworld, her face half skull, half real. Chinese myth and the wheel of life relating to the spinning sensation I experienced when waking. The feather, Egyptian myth, where your soul is weighed against that of the weight of a feather. I realized that whilst this experience was unique to me, it was not unique to humankind. What was evident was the commonality of trauma, a shared reality passed down through everyday language and everyday stories and myth. There was a blueprint after all. When it came to creating the reoccurring characters of emotion, body sens bodily sensation, abstract concepts, I drew animals and creatures that related to me and my history with the odd archetype thrown in. Pain I represented with seagulls. Um, from the morning that I became ill, a flock of seagulls were circling and calling outside my window. I also thought this was an interesting way to represent pain when we start to think about sound as well as just numbers. Coma I drew as a benign headless beast. 
hospital doors replaced its head. It was a tall, elegant figure, vulnerable and strong, and I was carried in the belly of it. Infection was inspired by the Ouroboros, life, death, rebirth, and in mine was the, the serpent. There was nothing about rebirth in my infection, it was about life and death. And death are re represented with a crow, a gothic archetype. Having developed the story and drawn it, I was struck by, when I had, sorry, when I had the book in my hand, the most striking thing I discovered was at the end. What I thought was the root of my accusation, my, my belief in the accusation and guilt and shame, I thought had come from natural questioning. Why am I here and how have I got myself here? What I realized when I turned the pages of the book was that I had absorbed everybody's emotions, their guilt, sorry, their fear and grief. These were acute emotions that I just didn't understand. We, sorry, reflecting on the cumulative elements of this experience, the most compelling and affecting elements came from the present. How, when confused and disorientated, in the absence of reason, my mind sought answers in fragments of conversation and, um, sorry, emotion in the room. And it sort of reshaped my reality into something fearful. So we can't, we can't control people's memories or eliminate fear, but we can affect the space that coma patients are treated in. And it's really useful for medics and for family members to be aware and mindful of the space they share. Not everyone has a negative experience in a coma. Not everyone remembers it. But those that do rarely forget it. So I've spoken to people that are still haunted after 20 years of their ICU delirium, unable to face it. It's as vivid now as it was then and other people who've tried to talk to their families about it, only for it to be dismissed as a dream. So you can forget a dream, but you rarely forget ICU delirium. So I think more openness about the impact of ICU, ICU delirium and being able to encourage patients as part of their recovery to unpick it in a way that's comfortable for them in a time of their choosing and to help family members help their loved ones heal. And also someone keeping a diary, taking notes, bearing witness can help reshape a shadow reality into something that you can understand and ultimately lay to rest. Thank you for listening.